All right, Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us. I'm Luca, one of the partners from Axel. Um, as you might have heard of us, we are one of the global leading venture capital firm with presence all across continents in US, uh, Europe, and Asia. And uh, tonight is a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, I'm going to introduce you to David, one of uh, our portfolio companies, the CEO. So David is CEO of, of Sender, where we've been uh, proud shareholders for two years now. And uh, I think we have a nice session today lined up speaking about uh, the role of m and uh, in uh, B2B marketplaces and how that can be helpful for, for growing your business. So David, I'll let you introduce and maybe we can take him from there as a also reminder to everybody what is all about uh, Sender. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. I'm David, co-founder and CEO here at Sender. So let's start with the basics. What is Sender all about and why are we invited to the Marketplace Conference? Um, well, Sender is a digital freight forwarder with a very specific focus, which is road freight and food truck load. Two technical terms, get back to them in a second. But our business model is straightforward. It's actually comparable to Uber Freight in the US or Uber for trucking. On one side, we have uh, large enterprise shippers, they're called Siemens, Coca-Cola, and so on, that have to move freight from point A to point B and need a truck to do so. On the other side of our business model, we have family-owned trucking companies that have five to 50 trucks. What we do is we bring these, side, these two sides together and do not only use a pure marketplace approach, but go a step further, which means we are the contractual partner and a single point of contact to both sides. So if you're familiar with Flixbus, I like to, to use them as an example. Um, uh, it's very similar uh, because we also repackage the service of these small companies, in our case, trucking companies, in the Flixbus case, bus companies, so that the touch and feel for uh, the customer is as if we own the assets, but exactly like Flixbus, we're completely asset light and do not hire any driver, but we own the end-to-end -end experience. And Luca, there's a sender. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great summary. But uh, more importantly, maybe using um, where you are today as a starting point of our discussion. Obviously, I think the point is that despite being still a young company in many ways, uh, you have done a lot of, of m and I think later uh, we'll talk about, uh, about, uh, about uh, what does it mean. But uh, if I take it, the news about the last 12 months, you have been announcing a lot of uh, activity. So shall we maybe recap what happened and why is the case? What has been that so important for you? Absolutely, it was, it was a crazy year. And to be completely honest, we did not anticipate to do so many deals <laughs> so quickly one after the other. But before I get to the deal, I just wanna put things into perspective and to uh, share how fast we grew. Um, so 14 months ago, we were 200 people in one office here in Berlin. Um, today, we are over 700 people in seven offices, and this growth came mainly through deals, three deals that we made, plus, of course, a couple of office opening that we did on our own, but these three deals added another 300 people to, to, to the sender family. And this, what are then these three deals? The first one, um, uh, and probably uh, the, the, the most significant one, is the acquisition of Uber Freight Europe. Uber Freight was for me always uh, a role model, someone that I looked up to, someone that, Luca, I don't know if you remember, but when we pitched to you two years ago, it was, you know, the big example where say in the US yep. it's working. So it was also a, a very cool moment when, when, when we were at the notary and, and signed the acquisition. Um, and uh, the second big deal uh, we, we made was the merger acquisition of Everroad, uh, which was our largest competitor at the time based in France um, uh, with a great team and a geographic focus that was complementing or complementary to two hours. And then the third, um, and from a strategic perspective, probably also maybe even the, the most significant one is a joint venture that we did with Post Italiane, which is the national mail and postal operator, where we convinced Post Italiane to hand us over the entire food truck load business that has been operating for 128 years. This means that we're now moving all the parcels and almost entire mail in Italy on the long distance from sorting hub to sorting hub. So Luca, if you don't get any Christmas presents this year, you know. Who, who exactly, do, I know that it's your fault. <laughs> yeah. 
At least yeah, but call. Think, yeah, I mean, th- thanks for that. And David, I mean, I know that you have quite strong opinions uh, in general, but in particular on, on the segment you've chosen for your company, which is the broader logistics space. And uh, we all know that in many ways, logistics as a sector, it is still relatively old school and very much regional. So I know about one of the strong opinion that you have is that uh, this makes the market more prone to m a across the board. And uh, maybe you have mentioned the company you have acquired, but can you tell us more about how you define your strategy on m a and why is that it's so important to do it firsthand from a CEO perspective? Because I think that could be relevant for many of the entrepreneurs that are listening to us now. Absolutely. Maybe I start with a couple of numbers to just explain how inefficient and how fragmented this market is. So you have to know, first of all, that 70% of all trucks that you see on highways are owned by companies that have fewer than 10 trucks. So it's a highly fragmented industry with the largest players in this industry that are called Kunanage, DB Schenker, DSB, having a combined market share of only 6%. Um, so it's a highly fragmented market with very limited technology adoption. Another number here that I like uh, to mention is that there's only 8% of GPS tracking uh, from uh, end-to-end. Um, uh, while if I order pizza or if I order a taxi, um, I have almost 100% of the, of the time GPS tracking. And this um, represents the inefficiency. Now, this is where technology plays an important role, but the big challenge we have in logistics today is technology adoption. If I'm completely honest, the technology we're developing today is not always rocket science. It's digitalizing processes, automating processes that have been around for a long time. But the big challenge we have is uh, adoption, convincing people to I use our technology, um, people that have been using pen and paper or maybe an Excel sheet for 20 or 30 years. And this is harder than we anticipated. And this is where also the acquisition strategy uh, makes a lot of sense because with the acquisition, uh, and I'm gonna talk about future acquisition and it's not talking about other digital startups that we're buying, but through the acquisition, and it was also the case with Everroad and Uber Freight, we also buy relationship or we get relationship um, on the carrier and shipper side and trust. And through this trust, you can push technology adoption. If you know someone for a long time and say, we're doing business together, I can tell him, listen, try to use our platform. You get your payments within three days and you can get regular uh, loads if you would like to see that, or you can book your loads directly digitally and instead of calling me or sending an email. If you have that trust relationship, it's something that, uh, that you can do. And it's also when we look at future M&A opportunities, we see a, a big opportunity here uh, because there are a lot of traditional freight brokers that have 20 to 100 people that are too small for private equity, too big for a neighbor to take over when the owner wants to retire. These are companies that have very strong relationship, have a lot of volume, which for our model is as important as tech adoption to increase the network optimization, where we can go uh, and, uh, and, and acquire them uh, in order to uh, push tech adoption, push network optimization, and still have a nice arbitrage on revenue multiples and on the economics overall. So we think that especially to kickstart tech adoption in certain geographies and to kickstart volume and network density in certain geographies, this can play a very important role going forward for us. So it's been all summarizing what you just said. It seems like it's been the perfect strategy for you to jumpstart and accelerate uh, somehow what you were already pushing in the market and allowing you to, to step forward by a by few, few years, which is very, is very compelling and powerful. But so you mentioned different typology of companies that we acquired and different typology of businesses that maybe you're even looking at. So you mentioned direct competitors, you mentioned regional competitors that are coming from, from the US, you mentioned a JV with a traditional postal company and now also traditional players. How it is to manage all of, of these together. I mean, from, from your perspective, again, as a CEO maybe, but also as the first person involved into all of that uh, uh, life. It's a, it's a very good question. And probably you have to ask me again in one, two or three years because I'm in the middle and probably have not yet fully understood uh, what it meant. But 
Um, the reason why I have a good feeling and why I think um, the acquisition and the post-merger integrations are going really, really well, because one of the major reasons we did this acquisitions were the teams and the people. And we invested really a lot of resources, not only to welcome our new team members, but also to assign responsibilities at group level um, uh, to then the extended team, making sure that especially the key position, the key leaders felt an integral being part of, of, of a bigger team and taking over responsibilities that suddenly were significantly bigger than the, what, what they had before. So I think on this people front and on the integration front, the culture integration is where right now we're investing a lot, where we're feeling that it's working. So as long as you have support from the organization that joined uh, the Sender family, it is something that you can do. The moment you have pushback, the moment you have some leader saying, I don't think it's a good idea, you will have a much harder time uh, to pull off the, the post-merge integration. But still, maybe it's a bit too early. Right now, I have a very good feeling, but maybe in one, two or three years time, uh, Luca, I, I hope I still have the same view, but might have a slightly different view. Yeah, that, that's exciting. And maybe you already touched on, on a few of the learnings, right? But what else can you share in terms of the biggest learnings you had in managing uh, uh, somehow those many transactional uh, very close to each other and which are the biggest mistake you have done? So a lot of learnings, a lot of mistakes. I think one clear learning was that things take significantly longer than we expected. Every road transaction took us five months. Uh, the Uber Freight transaction was a bit quicker. It took us four months. We always thought it would be quick. Uh, uh, significantly quicker. This means that you have to dedicate a lot of time and a lot of attention. Um, so this is in, 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 in the transaction building part. And I think then when you go into the post-merger integration, um, the big learning is to really invest time into people and uh, trying to set up from day one what the new organizational structure uh, would be, provide clarity on reporting lines and on uh, uh, communicating new roles and responsibilities with cases where people had similar titles but were doing different jobs and to bring clarity there uh, up front. Over communicate over and over. It's something I learned. You have to keep sending the same messages, um, sharing responsibility and not just seeing the, the team that joins as something that is a touch but really make sure that they're part. And I, I mentioned earlier given responsibility, for example, the former Uber Freight CEO of or general manager of Europe now joined as COO uh, at, uh, at Sender, taking over a lot of responsibility. It was a perfect fit because we were looking for um, a COO. Um, so providing responsibility over communicating and planning ahead of time. And maybe one last thing that I forgot to mention is build a good team around yourself to be able to manage that because there's a lot of details. It starts from the legal terms. It starts from the planning, post-merge integration. It starts with the tech integration, platform integration, where you need a lot of time and dedication. And this is where you need a team that uh, is not only fully committed, but also has experience in this and has ideally done it before. Yeah. And, and clearly, maybe you already touched upon a few points that are, we received some interesting question about. And a lot of questions uh, that we're seeing for the audience and beyond the, the audience itself also, from what I had in my, in my mind, is all about post-merger. You mentioned that uh, quite a few times, and generally it's very easy to talk about uh, mergers in general, but not that nice to talk about what comes after because there's a lot of uh, sweat and there's a lot of uh, work to be done. So you shed a light on how to manage post-merger integration with the team, how to anticipate problems, how to over-communicate. But uh, maybe tell us more, right? Because at the end of the day, there's one element, which is the company culture, how to manage that, how to make sure that once you acquire a team that comes from very different backgrounds, can really fit well within your organization and how to handle that. On the other side is also the need as a young company, uh, obviously to keep the growth uh, trajectory of your core business in the same time to make sure that the tech integration works. So how to do that, all of that? And uh, what is your secret sauce for that? I think it's breaking down the problem, have a good plan and then have the right people uh, to execute on that. I think that in our case, we had 
one big problem, which is Corona, uh, work from home. There's a lot of colleagues that I never, the joint center that I never met uh, before. And um, it's not easy. Uh, with the Everroad transaction, we manage in a short window between the two lockdowns to, to meet and bring the management team together. And just in the evening with a couple of beers and a couple of glasses of wine, how the entire dynamic changed and how we suddenly built a different sense of respect and trust um, is something that I did not expect. And I'm looking forward um, to doing um, with, uh, with the Uber Freight team as well, uh, where we did not have yet the chance to do that. I think it's especially important with Uber Freight, uh, with Uber Freight team, because Uber has a very strong culture, a very strong brand and a very strong loyalty. Um, so we are still in the process of making sure that all the new team members really like the orange color uh, that we have and uh, not as, as, uh, maybe more than the black um, of Uber. Uh, and this is where, again, we have a dedicated team that just, just focuses on cultural integration. They're doing a lot of fun things, even cooking sessions where we meet mix teams from different, uh, people from different teams and different offices to get to know each other, foster one-to-ones. I every week have a chance to meet two people of the new team for half an hour where we have a virtual coffee chat. These are all things that we're trying to do in order to bridge or the time until we fin finally meet. Uh, but building this personal relationship um, is, uh, is extremely important. Yeah, I mean, that, there's no doubt. And uh, also, again, maybe talking for a second on, on, on what is the, the biggest difference, right? Because you mentioned, again, tech-centric player you acquired, but also traditional players more on the GV front. And going forward, you said also that maybe you would like to look at more traditional businesses. So how hard it is um, more on the traditional front to make sure that you can uh, uh, convince people to embrace your culture? and convince them that obviously there's a different way of doing business than the one that may have been doing for the last decades this, at, the same, at the same speed, at the same, the same level of priorities with the same way of doing things. Uh, that's a very good question. And when we first started discussing with models of traditional players that we now um, are yeah, negotiating with, I always imagined um, these these companies being very old school, average age, maybe around 50 years, maybe kind of gray and so on. And we now looked at two companies, one before um, uh, the lockdown. Um, and we were very surprised to see that the average age was actually much younger. It was like six years older than um, the sender average age. Um, uh, and also the second target, maybe slightly eight years older, but it's still in, in, in much younger than we anticipated. Nevertheless, um, there is a cultural clash that will be or would be significantly higher than uh, in the case of Uber Freight or Everroad because it's different company cultures. Um, one, uh, and this is still something that we have to learn on how to address, but one interesting anecdote I wanna share with you is that one of the owners of one of the companies that we are currently uh, negotiating with have, has visited Sender a couple of times and picked up a couple of things like providing fresh fruits, having lunch with the employees, having an all hands meeting. And he picked up on all these things. And uh, I spoke to him last week and he said, uh, he was very proud to share with me that he already implemented a couple of these, um, these measures and the team was so surprised and so happy that they finally were speaking and, and, and sharing and, and something that uh, yeah, he, 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 did, uh, he did not see coming. Um, so I think that a lot of aspects that we bring is very, would be probably easy to implement. Of course, there's more discipline uh, on, on, uh, on, on tech utilization and probably a, a stronger focus on KPIs that uh, we would have to, um, uh, to push. But then it's also the question, how big are these teams? The smaller the teams, the probably easier it is to integrate them. The bigger the team, uh, the, the harder uh, this integration uh, is. That's great. Shall we talk a bit more about the future? So if you have to prioritize somehow in the next two to three years, your potential m &A activity, how would you do that? And which advice would you give to any other entrepreneurs that are, are tackling B2B marketplaces in general and considering potential m and opportunities? 
I want to emphasize that M and A is not in the focus. It's it's a nice addition. It's a nice way to jumpstart the new geographies. It's a nice way to optimize network uh, by 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 adding volume in certain geographies. But M and A takes also a lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of attention, and uh, there are a lot of statistics that tell how difficult it is to do M and A successfully. And there's a lot of M and A at the end phase. So I would be extremely, extremely careful. And I would recommend any other entrepreneur that uh, does M&A to clearly identify why are the reasons that I do this acquisition. It can be to grab market share. It, it can be to kick someone out. Uh, it can be like in our case to acquire team and business. And once you have clear, or can be to acquire technology, and, and, and once you have clearly defined what the purpose of the MNA is, then you have to really focus to keep that core in place and then overinvest. I think one thing that could have gone wrong, and we haven't seen it yet, so I assume it's, I believe it's, it's, it didn't happen, but what could have happened is that we focus on too many things, trying to do everything at the same time. We said the priority is the people for us. And we're going to figure that out on the way. There's, of course, things that are not working. There are, of course, employees that in switching their computers, they have problems in adopting the new technology. They struggle. There are a lot of customers that are, let's say, uh, asking why is now the interface orange instead of black and the buttons different. And these are all things that we're going to lose some customers. We're going to, but we said for us, the main focus in both acquisition is people and is what we uh, that, that we focus on. This is why we mark our KPIs for successful cross-merge integration is NPS score in the team and retention of the team. And this is something that we do monitor every single week when we have our cross-merger um, uh, steering committees uh, where we exactly see, okay, is there anyone potentially leaving? Um, who is it? Why is it? Can we talk to him? Can I talk to him? Sometimes communication, and this is, let's say, what I would recommend, identify what you buy or what, what, why, what is the main reason for the acquisition, and then really focus on making sure that that part remains intact um, and, and focus your resources on that. You cannot focus on, on, on keeping everything in the same way and integrating everything immediately in, 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 in your own ecosystem. Oh, oh, it's very difficult to do so. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you, David. I'm trying to uh, run through some of the questions that we received. And there's one interesting one that is saying, did you collaborate or partner with the companies uh, before doing the M&A? Which I guess is more about uh, talking how to get to know companies, right? So, and yeah. you said before, obviously process can take a few months, but how to, to really start a discussion like that? How to really do that? Yeah. Well, it's always tricky because especially if you're interested, you want to say you're interested, but also not that you're too interested. Um, in our case, in our two acquisitions, um, we were lucky enough to know the team beforehand. I always try to keep an open communication channel with Uber. Just before the lockdown, I was in San Francisco and met one of the co-founders just to catch up and, and meet and so on. And, and this made it much more, much easier then. And also in the case of Everroad, the founder, Max, super nice guy. Every time he came to Berlin, um, uh, we, we met for coffee. And this is how then the discussion started. And this is how we also were able to, I think, uh, build a trust relationship from very early on, which again, for us, because we did these acquisitions for the teams and the people mostly, um, uh, made, a, made a difference. Now for the new um uh, acquisitions of more traditional freight forwarders. We have um, a few senior managers in our team that have been in the industry for 20, 30 years. And the mandate they have is to scout for companies. And what we are pushing them to approach people that have been knowing for a long time, where you know that the fundamentals of the business, of the values of that company are healthy. Um, and this is how the two companies that we uh, actually are negotiating with came through exactly that network. One of our uh, senior managers, the most experienced one in our team, has known both founders of these companies for at least 20 years and um, therefore has also a slightly different way of, uh, of, of approaching them and making sure that they are very interested in, in talking to us. And another interesting question that we received is more around the 
capital needs, right? And how to approach uh, potential fundraising activity in light of m and and how to leverage that um, if possible. That's a, that's a very good question. So um, in our case, we did, uh, we did not do cash deals. So we didn't pay cash. We, we, we paid equity in, 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 in both cases. Well, um, with ex a few exceptions of maybe buying out a few angel investors or small investors to, to make the transaction a bit easier. So that's the equity side is, is, is an easy one. Um, here, it's also possible to link um, the payout with a performance uh, component. Um, in other words, the possibility to buy back shares, for example, at a nominal value if certain KPIs are not met, or some shares at least. Um, then, of course, there's the cash component, uh, cash option where you pay cash. But um, in the case of startups, uh, the valuation expectation were extremely high, and therefore uh, equity currency <laughs> is easier to use than cash. Uh, um, while if we talk about um, more traditional companies that also do not fully understand the, yeah, the startups uh, and are also a bit afraid of, 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 of these weird animals from, from, from their perspective, then cash combined potentially with an equity component to align long-term interest is an option. What we have not done yet, but um, uh, what, for example, Flixbus has done, uh, the Flixbus founders also investors in Sender is um, they did a lot of M&A as well. And um, one of the things they shared with us as a learning is what they did, they lined up deals, already signed uh, term sheets, which were conditional on fundraising. And this comes back to, to fundraising. So one thing that I found was very, very smart, we haven't done it yet. Maybe look at something I prepare, propose to the board soon, um, is uh, um, uh, to line up a couple of these tell the target companies, listen, we're gonna buy you, these are the terms, um, but I will pay you or kick off the, the acquisition the moment I get funding. And then once you go to the funding market, when, once you have two, three acquisitions lined up, you have a good story and a good opportunity to raise uh, money based on this acquisition that already lined up. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. And then another more practical one, um, how much do you do with in-house people versus using uh, external advisor or helper providers? It at the end depends on the people. Um, if you have an amazing internal people, uh, internal team, um, or if you don't, you have to find the external one. My personal experience is that internal people work better, um, especially in this, high then uh, if, if there are multiple transaction one after the other that's why uh, we we expanded our team with people that have been working with us with external counselors that have been working with us we brought them in uh, and, and asked them to join um, the sender team uh, but at the end of the day it depends on the people if you have the right team then we we'll do it internally i think that especially if you do multiple transactions if you just want to do one or two transactions then you have to do the to find the right external consultants uh, or support. And one recommendation I would do here is do reference calls on these advisors because um, yeah, they have to know what they're doing. And if they have done these transactions before in your space, they can easily connect you and take that half an hour or 20 minutes to do these calls. Yeah, I think uh, we're just running a few minutes uh, late, I guess. so. Unless uh, uh, everybody is stopping us uh, or not, I think we're just uh, finishing up. Thank you very much, David. And thank you very much again to your organizer for this nice chat. Thank you, Luca. Ciao. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.